Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome uh, here to the Bipartisan Policy Center. We are excited to be discussing the issues of uh, environment and social governance today with a group of really thoughtful and talented folks. Um, we are actually very committed to the idea of dialogue, and we will, in fact, have time for a significant amount of interaction with all of you. So um, you are obligated to stay thoughtful and focused and have lots of good questions. Um, what um, I want to do is just kind of uh, introduce the panel, and then the line on my left is going to present just a couple of kind of grounding uh, slides, and then we will jump into a conversation with our guests. I think, um, as you all know, we are at a rather dynamic moment in this broader conversation about the role of corporations and how they engage and design economic and social and spiritual aspects of our society. Um, and I think the role has been changing quite a bit in the last several years. So we're going to try to at least understand that a little bit with a group of people who are uh, living those changes. Um, I was just uh, looking up a little bit of information you know, more broadly. And there's um, some really interesting polling out there which talks about the changing kind of social expectations of corporate behavior. There was a poll by a global strategy group which says that you know, broad public uh, poll, 77% believe that corporations are responsible for bringing about social change, which is closely behind what people believe the role of government is. The president and Congress both rated an 85% um, rating in terms of their expectation that they would be involved in social change, which does make you wonder what the other 15% believe government's role might be. But a full three quarters of the population believes that corporations don't just have obligations to shareholders and employees, but actually have a proactive obligation to be activist in designing social policy. I think um, it's also clear from the polling that these expectations have increased some in the last 18 months. Um, between uh, 2016 and 2017, the strength of views that corporations have obligations to be making these social policy decisions, whether it's regulating to immigration or guns or environment or employment, of, you know, underserved communities um, is also very much on the rise. And so we here at BPC are interested in trying to understand how this is evolving in the juxtaposition between kind of corporate responsibility and government responsibility. Um, and while you know, ESG, as we will learn in a moment, is a very broad context, particularly the S, right? Social can incorporate a lot of different imaginations. I think it's um, appropriate that we're starting to focus uh, with energy companies, which have really always been on the vanguard of these issues. And I think we'll unpack this a little bit. But at least from my perspective, um, you know, energy companies have spent the better part of a century operating in regions that don't have the most predictable and reliable forms of government. And there has been an expectation on these incredibly significant corporate presences that they have a role and a certain responsibility that tra transcends the obligations that are being placed on them. I think we all know that um, energy companies make decisions with very significant long-term consequences. These are 20, 30, sometimes 50-year decisions. And so the concept of risk, investment risk, is much more, I think, um, pronounced when it comes to energy infrastructure than it might be if you were an app developer. Um, Despite what I think is a very um, robust and intense safety culture, the energy industry also has had catastrophic accidents. And that risk always obtains. And I think that also brings a focus to these questions in a way that is not always as obvious. Um, and then finally, a lot of this we know is being driven by the debate over climate. And the energy industry really is at kind of ground zero in this global collective action challenge at a moment when at least the US government is saying, really nothing to see here. And I think the divergence there is motivating a lot of this public response. And so trying to think about you know, ESG, not just in the context that we'll hear about it, the very interesting work that companies are doing, but in that broader question about how corporations, obligations, and interests are related to what's happening in the broader fabric of our society is what really motivates us to want to think about this quite a bit. And I think this is the first in what we expect will be kind of a series of these discussions. So I welcome you. And um, when I, um, before introducing all of our panelists, just, um, well, actually, let me do that. Let me introduce our panelists and then ask Alana to take over. Alana is the director of um, policy and social responsibility at HBW Resources, which has helped us conceive of and pull this event together. She's a 
conveniently an expert on ESG, so her presentation will make sense. Prior to working at ESG, she was an analyst at Newmont Mining and a project manager at IHS, and so she has a uh, broad sense of these issues across a number of different industries. Uh, next is Don Shabazpour, who is with National Grid. Don is the Director of Climate Change Compliance. Um, but it focuses, I think, as we'll hear a lot on the broader natural gas sustainability issues. He recently, uh, previously, was the Director of National Grid's Utility of the Future Initiative. And uh, also kind of a startup guy, you can tell by the glasses. He um, has worked in a number of companies, focused a little bit on distributed energy and some other little guy business experiences that I hope he'll bring to bear. Maria Dunn uh, with uh, Philip 66 is the manager of policy and emerging issues, a, a daunting title um, as far as I can tell. Uh, she leads the sustainability strategy and their broad ESG engagement. Prior to this job, she worked on the uh, legal guts of uh, M&A litigation, commercial transactions for the company, and prior to that, she was actually an attorney in Illinois dealing with legal issues that relate to just people like us. And so um, Maria has been at this for a little while. We look to hear from that experience. Um, Tom Reisenberg is the Director of Legal Policy and Outreach at SASB, which is the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. He exists because of this issue, and so Tom has a lot of uh, experience to bring to bear. He was the Deputy General Counsel for about 20 years at Ernst & Young, where I think he really had the experience of advising companies in this space. He was the Associate Counsel at the SEC, and also an adjunct professor at Georgetown Law. And last, certainly not least, John Williams with the Apache Corporation. He directs the Health, Safety, and Environmental Affairs program. Um, spent a few decades in different aspects of this uh, industry, working on both power gen and transmission, also on hazardous waste issues, and then the last uh, 20 or so years focusing on oil and gas production. Um, and so, uh, as you can tell, we have uh, a lot of experience on the panel, and I shall now ask Alana to uh, begin to share that, and we'll get into some conversation. Great. Well, thank you so much for the introduction. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here today with the distinguished panelists that we have to discuss a topic that is so pertinent and prevalent today. Um, we really are experiencing a paradigm shift, and um, I'm thrilled that we're having the opportunity to have this panel because we're all going to be providing a lot of expertise in the area of ESG as it relates to oil and gas. So my role right now is to essentially kind of give a overview 101 of what ESG is, mostly because there's different ways of speaking about ESG, of what it means and the benefits and the positive role of it. And we just want to ensure that everybody is completely aligned as to why we're talking about it, the benefits of why it exists today. And then we're going to dive right into the panel. So uh, that's my role. And uh, if you have any questions during Q&A of anything I bring up in this, please feel free to ask. So what is ESG? For those of you in the room who are not familiar with it, ESG stands for Environmental Social Governance. And the best way to think about that is it is a way to categorize risk in a sustainability and social responsibility realm. It's a new way to loop in risk from a way businesses have been always looking at risk mitigation from their perspectives. So the marketplace is rapidly changing and businesses, CEOs are incorporating non-financial social responsibility decisions into their process of strategy and decision making. Investors are also looking beyond traditional financial statements to incorporate ES and G risks to get an idea of how companies are looking at risk from a holistic perspective of issues that might not have necessarily been on the forefront of their radar. So it's really a two-fold discussion between corporations and investors. So what I'd like to do at this point is start with an example, a very high level example, but very pertinent and relevant to kind of bring us all together of why this is important. The idea of water management is key in ESG. It's one of the fundamental met metrics that we discuss, particularly in the oil and gas realm, I'm sure, as we'll discuss. So take an example of energy operations in the Permian Basin. The US rig count in the Permian Basin has been exponentially increasing to, because of the shale revolution that occurs. While we also have agricultural demands, drinking water demands, water is a high priority item in the Permian Basin. So it's also a water stressed region, excuse me, a water stressed region in that area. So take two companies, Company A and Company B. Company A has a water management plan in place. They realize it's a risk, their operations and as an input, so they want to ensure that they have a way to manage that input, that resource for their company's operations. Take Company B. Company B is business as is. They've been operating fine, no immediate risk on their radar. They've just been kind of going business as usual. If 
the Permian experience is warmer and there's less access to water in that region, one of two things is going to happen to Company B who does not have a water management plan in place. One, they're going to have to pay more to get access to the same amount of input to be able to get the same output and sell in the market. Or they will not be able to get the same amount of water as an input because there's less of it. So if just by fundamental economics, if you have less of an input, you have less output, less product to sell, less revenue in your pocket. Either way, whether you're looking at the front end or the back end of that, that impacts cash flow. So the point that I'm trying to get to is this is a financial conversation. What we're discussing today is truly a risk mitigation practice as it relates to sustainability. And this is just one example of other ESG metrics that are financially material to companies' operations and risk profiles. But water is just one example of that, and that's kind of the example I'm going to be taking us through the rest of the time. So on the slide here, you can see that there's two ways of looking at it from the, corporate's perspective, from the corporate perspective to essentially increase a holistic picture of what risk is. And then from an investor's perspective of saying, hey, there are companies that are looking at risk from a larger perspective. This is probably a better investment for me because, for example, company A, who has a water management plan in place, might have a better opportunity to grow and essentially reduce our risk of not having as much product on the market. And we actively see today that investors are shifting capital flows to the company that has a water management plan in place. It is less risky. It has a higher return. And therefore, it's very interesting for our investors to discuss that. The uh, US SIF Foundation wrote a report in 2016 that says one in every $5, so 20% of investable <clears throat> dollars out of 8.72, or one in every five of investable dollars are going to sustainable investing, which incorporates ESG. That is about $8.72 trillion <coughs> is put in this space. And that's because this is an empirically proven investment in company operational best practices, best practice. It's, it works, people know it works, and so they're utilizing it. We just talked about how it is a risk management strategy across the board. And then an interesting fun fact about ESG is women and millennials are really driving the movement in ESG. And the reason why that's interesting is because Morgan Stanley conducted a report that says 84, I believe, percent of millennials are interested in sustainable investing or putting their money towards investments that consider ESG or socially responsible investment best practices. Why that's interesting is because in the next decade, millennials are going to be inheriting a lot of the assets and portfolio management practices that go that moves capital across our country. So if they care about this topic and you're a company that has not necessarily considered ESG, you're going to be behind the curve a little bit and a little bit at risk. So that's why uh, we're having this discussion. Oops, I went way too fast. Uh, that's why we're having this discussion today. So this slide is essentially the cash law for why we're talking about ESG today. You can see, again, that it's the categories of E, S, and G, environmental social governance. As this is an oil and gas panel, we want to make it relevant. The E's are related to oil and gas in terms of GHG emissions, air quality, water management. Social is community relations, uh, health and safety. And then governance is you know, political transparency, business ethics, all the typical G's you would necessarily see. Why this is important is because those metrics have financial value tied to them. And that financial value can either be revenue and cost, assets and liabilities, cost of capital. In one way or another, there is financial value, like the water management example, of if you don't consider these metrics, you're naturally not considering a holistic picture of a company's risk. And you want to do that. That is what is happening. And that's why this is a paradigm shift. So because you're able to connect those sustainability metrics with revenue costs, assets, liabilities, that funnels into cash flow conversation. And that's what CEOs care about. They want to know how their cash flow is at risk because you have to report out to your investors, have to report out about equity, you know, what your interest payments are in dividends, or sorry, interest payments and dividends. So when cash flow changes, all of the bottom indicators you can see on the screen start to shift, whether that is, and I can look at it here, your equity and debt, so dividend payments to your investors, or paying out interest if it's debt, OPEX and CAPEX. Imagine there's a regulation that passes and companies have to retrofit their assets to abide by certain regulations. That is extremely expensive to do. That's an example of expenditures that would occur. If your company is more risky, for example, the water management and company B that does not have a plan, if you are more risk, a riskier investment as a company, by the nature of finance, your cost of capital increases, which means you are valued less than your peers. So you are actually valued at a lower level if you are a riskier company. 
And then finally, your accounting ratio shift. Just like any cash flow indicators, you start to have your debt to service change, your IRR change, your ROE. So those accounting indicators start to shift. So the point that I want to get across today is this is a numbers conversation. This is not a you know, fuzzy bike share program will make employees happy. Let's talk about that. This is truly what are you not considering in your risk strategy? What is going on, and particularly in the oil and gas industry, that you can essentially pull into your business strategy to become a best-in-class entity? And by doing so, the bottom line is that you get more investors, operational cost savings, market and accounting outperformance, stock bump, and it's a positive signal to those external rating agencies who really put those numbers out there for investors. So uh, I wanted to fly through that but to make sure we got to the panel. But uh, that's my presentation. So thank you all so much. Thank you very much for kind of setting the stage. It is uh, a broad set of issues that we are now going to dive into. And just to kind of get things rolling, um, some of you are political junkies will remember uh, Admiral James Stockdale. He was the 1992, he's actually James Bond Stockdale, if you care enough. Um, and it, he began the 1992 vice presidential debate by famously saying, who am I and why am I here? And so that was actually the question I was going to pose um, to our four panelists. If you could just you know, give us two or three minutes, you know, we're going to come back to all these, but you know, what's the issue that really um, made you thrilled? to say yes when we invited you to come join us on a Thursday morning to talk about ESG. And Don, we'll just go down the sure. down the Great. Line. Well, good morning. Um, thank you for inviting me. It's, it's great to be here. Um, my biggest challenge is going to be to convey to you why all of that in 90 seconds, because I feel like I could talk for an hour. So I guess let me just start with the big picture context. You know, why are we doing this? And it really starts out with the states that we operate in, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, uh, and New York. All of those three states have an 80-50 goal. We are fully supportive of those uh, goals. In addition, National Grid, we have our own internal 80-50 targets, and we've also been very actively. And this is 80% GHD reductions by 20. Correct. I'm sorry, it was that jargon. I'm gonna. I'll, I'll try to do my best to go through those jargons. You got a little jar. That's um, important. And we have also been fully supportive of the Paris Agreement, and and we were one of the companies that took out that ad in the New York Times and Washington Post here, urging the Trump administration to stay in the Paris Agreement. And I just want to provide that context because it's really important. We're often asked, and this comes back from the other side that you were talking about, by our customers and our stakeholders and our regulators, especially our customers, we want to know where do you stand on climate change and your utility. So I thought that big picture context is important because it sets the stage, why are we doing these things? So, and I'll just focus um, and I'll highlight two efforts. The first one is the Natural Gas Supply Collaborative uh, being managed by another tenant in this building, MJ Bradley. It's a collaborative, it's a voluntary collaborative of gas purchasers. It includes some of the biggest utilities, us, Con Ed, Excel, PG&E, Northwest Natural, and some of the power producers uh, like NRG and, and Calpine. And we, the collective we as buyers of the commodity, are developing these non-financial performance indicators that you were talking to, that you were talking about, to promote that safe and responsible development of gas. And I can come back and talk about it in more detail, but they essentially fall those 14 indicators, um, and they fall into four buckets. It's emissions, mostly methane emissions, air emissions, water, um, and chemical, and then community and safety. So that's one effort. The other effort I'll just highlight um, is the, uh, what we call the One Future. It's one Future is one of the programs under the uh, Methane Challenge. It's an EPA endorsed program. And this is representing the entire value chain from wellhead to burner tip, where we are committing to having an emissions rate, a leak rate of 1% or less. And just to give you a sense, uh, the current leak rate, if you look at the EPA's GHGI, from wellhead to burner tip of all the gas that's produced, it's about 1.3, 1.4%. That's the amount of gas that's emitted from, again, the entire value chain. We're committing to that 1% or less by 2025. Mm -hmm. And it does represent the entire value chain. Uh, we're one of the founding members. John from Apache is one of the founding members. Um, but I think this was a big shift um, for our industry. When I started my career, when I was working for a gas utility you know, 10 years ago, and you said, you know, what's your position on, the, on, on you know, gas being produced? The general position of utilities was, we're not in that business, right? We just buy the commodity, we're not a production company, we're just a distribution company. You know, we no longer take that position. We own the whole thing all the way up to the wellhead. So um, again, like I said, I could talk about now on this. Well, the, the big consumer question I think is really important, so we will definitely want to come back and <laughs> drill down there some more. 
So anyway, that was my two-minute overview. You. And I'll fantastic. You've set an questions. excellent precedent. Maria. Thank you. Philip 66 is here today, and we're tickled to be here because of having a rational conversation. That's one of the things that I think Bipartisan Policy Center brings together, people who want to dive into the, the information in a, in a balanced way. Um, if you think of Apache and Philip 66, generally, um, together, we're peanut butter and jelly of the oil and gas patch. So we don't produce oil and natural gas, but we buy it, and we refine it, and we sell it, and we distribute it globally. Um, and why do I say that? Because it's important to continue to educate our stakeholders, particularly the investment community, we have found. We had a corporate transaction about six years ago where we um, spun off with ConocoPhillips, and there was a lot of, while well, we put out a lot of uh, work to the street and, and externally, of educating of, of who we are, who are our operations, what is the value chain of Phillips 66. We've done a lot of engagement with the investor community and others probably the last 18 months. And what I think we can share today and dive into a little bit is the feedback from investors that we have found on ESG and other matters is we value the industry. We don't fully understand it, so we need you to tell us about it. And, and that was um, as simple as that is. It's not always easy to do, and it's a charge that we've taken. And we balance that with, and I think I'm perfectly seated between uh, Tom and Don and, and John, um, there is a, 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 a cachet of rating firms that have developed, really significant rating firms. And so they have a challenge because they cover many, many sectors and many, many companies of getting it right. And so part of our role has been to engage with them to educate them on what Philip 66 is, what we do, and how we do it. The last thing I'll throw out as we continue our introductions to think about is, I think the G is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. You almost can think about this as GES, because with good governance, so many of the other systems and policies and structures are built on that foundation. And so our board of directors is really involved in our strategy setting. It's a very diverse board of directors. We have a third women on our board. And from there, our leadership team is very involved, and it just goes throughout the organization. So don't forget the G. Excellent. Tom. Tom. Well, I'm glad you asked the Stockdale question because it's appropriate for me. Why am I here? I'm not a, an oil and gas expert. Um, I am a, a lawyer by training, and I've worked for uh, 35 years on uh, uh, disclosure issues. So uh, I've worked for now for uh, three, about three years with SASB uh, after I retired from Ernst & Young. SASB uh, is an organization that is um, that I, I don't know if many of you are familiar with it, but we started a, about six years ago. Uh, it's uh, uh, based in San Francisco. We have uh, uh, about about 30 people working for us. Uh, it was largely funded uh, and has been funded by uh, Michael Bloomberg and the Bloomberg uh, Philanthropies. The goal is not uh, any, th basically it's very simple. We think investors, and we're focused on the investors of the world, we're not focused on a broad range of stakeholders, uh, uh, but we are focused on what we think investors should know about ESG type matters. It's been shown uh, and been voiced by uh, the investor investment community for many, many years that they don't get the information in a decision useful manner. They don't have the information that enables them to compare company to company performance. Um, and the information that tends to be uh, provided in uh, SEC filings uh, tends to be a lot of boilerplate with a lot, without the kind of specific metrics and information that would be useful for making investment decisions. And uh, in the last, particularly in the last two or three years, obviously this issue's been around a long time, the uh, degree of uh, interest by the investment community in this topic is really just uh, skyrocketed, and um, we can go into that in a little more detail in a moment. But so SASB is there, basically, uh, you know, SASB is here to help 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 companies get the information to the investment world in a way that is helpful and meaningful to investors. Um, we develop standards that are specific to industries. We have divided the world up into 77 industries. So there's an oil and gas industry, of course. There's a hotel industry. There's a uh, pharmaceutical industry, et cetera. And because the conclusion was reached a long time ago that standards need to be industry specific. Climate change, one of the most pervasive kinds of ESG type issues that people think of, 
even that doesn't apply in our uh, analysis to every one of the 77 industries. So you have different standards for each industry. There's a limited number there. Uh, we develop topics, which is the general issue, and then under each topic there will be a set of metrics, and there's not a ton of them. There are about 15 or so per industry. Companies then can decide whether this is stuff that is uh, material, and our approach has been to develop financially material standards, so uh, uh, material being a legal term for really what's important to an investor in making the decision. We can't clearly describe what that is for every specific company. Every company has to make its own decision, and these are voluntary standards, although we can perhaps talk in a moment about you know, how voluntary are there, because there are some existing regulatory disclosure requirements, but they are essentially voluntary requirements financially material information that companies can use in a way that uh, satisfies the investor demands. And so that's, uh, that's what it is in a nutshell, and be happy to talk about it in more detail as time goes on. And thanks for inviting me. Welcome. John, you want to close down our kind of initial stretching with a little Apache uh, perspective? Oh, sure, Jason. Thank you. Um, as you mentioned, I'm, I'm here actually wearing several different hats. Uh, I work for Apache. Uh, Apache's been very uh, active and open in the ESG space, uh, have a lot of initiatives we'd you know, like to discuss more, more in depth with you. Uh, but I'm also here to represent a, uh, the Environmental Partnership, which is an API uh, group that uh, began a little over a year ago and, and uh, uh, is a collaboration of companies in the energy uh, production space to further develop the technology and techniques for uh, uh, environmental stewardship. Uh, it's starting out with emission control, that's one of the uh, key focus areas right now, but it's uh, titled Environmental Partnership so that it has a broader reach. Uh, as mentioned, Apache is also a founding member of the One Future organization, and uh, there's a lot of good things that, that we're trying to say about the energy space. Uh, it did dawn on me uh, before the meeting, um, you know, this, this is, uh, things change a lot over time. I began my career in the mid-70s. In the mid-70s, we were just, as a, the United States was coming out of the Arab oil embargo, there were gas lines, there were energy shortages and concerns about the ability to produce electric power in this, this country. And some people thought we'd found all the fossil fuel there was to find, so, uh, in the utility business where I, I began, we were sh having to shut down natural gas power plants along the, the Gulf Coast of Texas, Louisiana, and build coal plants so that we could move coal from Wyoming down to the Gulf of Mexico and generate electricity and, and uh, also uh, converted some gas units to burn heavy fuel oil, of all things, and uh, uh, built the last few nuclear plants before that uh, came to an end. And, and if you look at that today, where the United States is, is uh, an energy exporter, meeting our needs and, and able to share with the rest of the world, it's, it, it just shows you how what we think we know at any one moment in time can, can change. And, and that the, really the underlying subject matter for all of this is energy. Energy for the security of this country, energy for the welfare of the people through jobs and and power, and and eventually, hopefully, energy for uh, to share with the rest of the world. You know, the we can't lose perspective in our first first world kind of discussions that you know half half the people on planet Earth don't have electricity in their home, and and cheap affordable power can help their lot in life too. So we appreciate the opportunity to be here, Jason. So I want to kind of kick off the discussion by you know, teasing out one of the harder um, mixes of issues, which is the variety of different motivations for this. Right? There is a very kind of tangible, value-neutral investor bottom line idea. And then there's also this more kind of inchoate social responsibility brand, somewhat more consumer motivated, a little bit less obvious. Um, and there's in some ways a tension between the two. And I just want to, you know, Larry Fink at BlackRock, who has taken a rather prominent voice in these issues, um, recently wrote that, quote, society is demanding that companies, both public and private, serve a social purpose. 
To prosper over time, every company must not only deliver financial performance, but also show how it makes a positive contribution to society. And that's pretty evocative. I mean, it sounds cool. Um, but I want to ask you all to try to talk a little bit about the tension between quarterly profits and shareholders who are investing money because you're a company and they want their money back, and people who have maybe longer term, you know, pension, insurance company investors, and then this idea that some people are really trying to use the corporate power to change social issues. I mean, how, you know, and throw it at you first, Maria. I mean, how do you, how do you think about balancing those different imperatives, and do you see places where they are in tension? Well, they can be, because as a publicly traded company, we're really regulated. And so with whatever changes are going on with the administration and trying to streamline regulations, that's not going to go away. And the, the SEC, for example, there are a lot of disclosures, a lot of good stuff in proxies. Uh, may not be the most scintillating reading sometimes, but, but the risks are there. The material risks are there. The structure is there. The annual report, the structure is there. So companies are putting that out there. But then there's also the longer term view that you're talking about, which is most our company has, has a longer term strategy. What is that? Uh, how do we make that more conversational and connect the two? So I don't view it as a tension. I think it's a, um, a different way of being conversational. That said, I think there's a risk in uh, some of the one pager, if you will, an overview. Here's your composite ESG score. You get a 75. Not sure out of what, not compared to whom, uh, peer comparisons or something else we can talk about maybe afterward. Um, but there's a, there's a real danger in that, I think, because it's overly simplistic. Uh, I don't know that the analysis that went into it, what's the understanding of the person who went into it, what's their workload that went into it. You may be wondering, why is Philip 66 not talking about one methane or, or one future? Methane is just not really an issue in our operations. So it's a, an important public issue. You're hearing a lot about it, and we're happy to talk with people about it, but it takes energy to make energy. Most of our greenhouse gases are CO2 from our, from our operations. And so uh, <coughs> methane for us is, is coming in to heat the heaters and, and the boilers. And, and if there is a leak there, we're going to know about it and get on it right away. Or there might be something from the flare tip, and there's a combustion rate that's required there. So we're, methane is not an issue, but you might not know that unless you're informed and engaged in working with people. And that's a longer term conversation because people come into the industry and following it and informed in it, that's a long term changeover. Um, we have a real mix in our uh, workforce, millennials, and it's about a third, a third, a third. So you may have seen the saddle with some of the oil and gas industry with a lot of new workforce, a lot of aged workforce. We've worked over time for a longer term issue on the S and it's pretty balanced. But it calls into question the need for educating on the operations and where we um, have our footprint and how we manage it. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I answered no, any of your you question at all, Jason, that's but, what we're doing here. but it's, it's so, been some of the things that some of the other members have talked about. Don, just to tip, pull you into this a little bit. So, you know, National Grid, you, you have a European context. You're not just a U.S. company. And you talked about the fact that you're in states that have a pretty, you know, aggressive as kind of climate you know, profile. But... It seems like National Grid is trying to articulate an ethos, a kind of corporate responsibility, you know, um, idea that is beyond just kind of an immediate reduction of risk. Is what's that motivated by? I mean, is, have, you know, is there a, is there a sharp pencil behind that which says that this is in fact a business proposition, or is this just because you think it's the right thing to do? It's it's the latter. It's, we you know we think it's the right thing to do, but it's also like our customers demand it. And it, and it is by, you know, it's customers, it's policy, it's all of those. Um, and, you know, when our CEO goes out and speaks, you know, he starts out by saying climate change is the greatest challenge that humanity faces today, right? So what does that mean? That includes a lot of things. Part of it is ESG. Um, the, the most difficult thing is going back to your previous question is that tension, right? That tension does exist and there is that um, it, it comes, what I would call sort of ambivalence, um, and, and I'll give you sort of a quick example. When we used to do our complex construction, used to do these gas infrastructure, uh, they would never call me. I was just, it was, you know, I was never invited to those community board meetings, uh, whether in New York City, and Boston. Now I'm always the first person who gets invited um, because the community gets up and asks. The, the questions 10 years ago used to be, are you going to work over the weekend 
you know, are you going to work beyond 5 p.m.? Those are no longer the questions that the community and the uh, mayor's office or, or the people are asking. They're always, they're always asking, what are you doing about this area of ESG? What are you doing to reduce emissions? And they start asking, like, really good questions, like, do we need this infrastructure to hit these deep decarbonization targets? So from being never invited to these meetings, and now I'm always being invited to these meetings, that's a very big shift that's coming externally. Um, some of the tension that you mentioned comes from the ambivalence, I, I would say, and it's just sort of educating the customers. For example, they, you know, some people will get up and say, we no longer need this gas infrastructure investment in our city, whether it's New York or Boston. And we have to explain, do you know what does the gas system do today? And we talk about, you know, peak days versus summer and winter. Like very simple fundamental basics, like the gas system on a peak day in winter delivers the amount of energy that's in multiples of the electric system that could deliver on the peak day in the summer. And it does it in a much cheaper. And talking about all of those issues, there's always a lot of these aha moments. So it's, it's a lot of, it requires just a lot of engagement with all of these stakeholders who have different perspectives and lenses. I wonder if any other panelists could reflect on at least the impression I have is that the public investor voice is very much socially minded. I'm told that the private investor, private investor voice is, what's your return? And I've certainly heard from a number of folks in the energy industry that there's pushback on some of the new tech, cleaner tech investments because they're not penciling out that when you know a company makes a $17 billion commitment to uh, you know algae renewables, that some of their shareholders are saying that's not what I want you to do. I mean, is that, is that am I making that up, or is there a subtext to some of these discussions that's not as obvious. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. I, an, an, a really important piece to remember about ESG is that it is a long-term perspective investment outperformance approach, right? So what's kind of happening right now in terms of you know, investors and demand and what companies are doing to interact in this space is there has to be a little bit of a mentality shift to demand that a company must write out its earnings every quarter and have to keep outperforming every quarter because ESG by its nature is long term. You're doing a business optimization process to end to end to see how you're utilizing your resources, your human capital, whatever it may be in the most you know, efficient and effective way. So by its nature, that's longer term. But that doesn't mean that people are still demanding that you have to have outperformance. And so what's interesting about this topic is yeah, there might be specific you know, renewable projects or you know, algae development projects that are coming on board. Um, companies might kind of take that into their profile of some E, S, or G initiatives that they want to really start to loop in for best practices. But you know, in the end, oil and gas remains a fundamental part of portfolio diversification. It just has been for investors. And so the, the opportunity for oil and gas is really to become that best in class approach of really managing, like I was discussing before, the risk from a holistic perspective. Because you know, as Don was just talking about, oil and gas is not going to go anywhere. We have it for as the foreseeable future. So what can we do to operate in this space as in a way that's sus sustainable and also in a long-term goal? But it's a little bit of a paradigm shift. You have to. It, essentially shift that mindset of being, what are my returns on a quarterly basis to, how am I going to do in the next five years, which I believe Larry Fink from BlackRock as well put out a statement saying it has to be a longer term perspective, not quarterly. Tom, is there, you know, what, what's the story on how ESG relates broadly to company performance? I've certainly yeah. heard well, people say, hey, the companies that are scoring really well on ESG are also yeah. the most competitive. Well, there, there's a lot of studies, uh, there's a lot of research, there's a <coughs> Uh, the most relevant study from the SASB perspective was done by uh, just about a year and a half ago by a professor at uh, Harvard named George Seraphim who used the, the, stand, the SASB metrics to, uh, and, and, tr and looked at how companies were performing uh, on their uh, stock, perform stock price performance and found that there was, if there was disclosure on material ESG matters, a company uh, performed better than uh, companies that were not making those disclosures. There's a, there's a, a lot of uh, relevant uh, analyses of, of that point, um, and uh, there, will, there will certainly be more as time goes on. So I, I should note um, it, w with respect to a couple of things. Well, first of all, on the, the long-term versus short-term issue, I mean, you know, that issue's been around for a long time. It's a very, very important debate uh, for the overall 
performance of the American economy, <clears throat> you know, and uh, it's, you know, I, I think there's a, a lot of investor interest in trying to move a little bit more towards the long-termism and away from short-termism. There are a number of different international organizations that are focused on that issue, and uh, I think you're going to hear more and more of that. Larry Fink, of course, at, you know, at, prominent in, the, in that debate. Um, what, what we have found, and I think it's not just uh, just SASB's found this, it's, it's much more broadly known, um, that the, the development over the last 30, 40 years uh, of, of um, ESG focus by investors has moved substantially from the so-called so socially responsible investor, the SRI investor, as it's often referred to, which uh, to a much more mainstream time of, time of, uh, type of investment interest. What's, and and what, what is perhaps uh, relevant and, and helpful in looking at that issue is uh, what the SEC did over the last 40 years on this issue. After the uh, Congress passed the, uh, na the uh, National Environmental Policy Act in 1970, <clears throat> there was litigation brought by the uh, NRDC, the Natural Resources Defense Council, saying that companies uh, pursuant to the, uh, to the newly, newly passed NEPA, uh, companies should be required by the SEC to make disclosures of various ESG matters in their SEC filings. <clears throat> and there's a lot, this litigation went on for several years, uh, back and forth, and the SEC finally concluded, no, it's not necessary, there's just too little, there's not enough interest. We find a very small, maybe it's 1% or 0.1% of investors are really interested in this stuff, and therefore it really isn't something that should be required. Then two, two years ago, skip forward to 2016, the SEC issued a concept release on a much broad array of, a broad array of issues on Regulation SK, which is the fundamental disclosure uh, rule, set of rules for, for uh, uh, public companies. And one of the issues they, post, they, they, they posed out of a 300-page release, about nine pages were devoted to whether there should be better disclosure of these ESG sustainability type issues. <clears throat> that was the, uh, maybe not the biggest, but one of the top two or three topics for commenters to submit their comments to the SEC. And there was an, almost a uniform demand for better disclosures. And these were mainstream investors. So there's really been a substantial change in this, in this kind of environment, in, this, in the interest in this area. We have, and I won't take a lot more time, but uh, SASB put together an investor advisory group a couple of years ago. We now have about 20, uh, no, about 35 of the largest uh, asset managers and asset owners in the country on this investor advisory group. It made they, uh, $26 trillion under management or ownership. And these are these. This is Vanguard. This is BlackRock. This is Goldman Sachs. This is everybody. And they all say we want better disclosure. We want more information. This is relevant to the risks and opportunities that companies have. This is relevant to what investors need to know. These ratings that uh, were, were mentioned b before are not really the kind of. Uh, the bases for making investment decisions for a whole range of issues they don't reasons they don't really give the good information that investors need so that's where we are in the uh, in the uh, I give I've given you a 40 year summary if I hope that's okay so I want to John talk a little bit about the environmental partnership and I want to um, see if I can frame it it's kind of even more broadly in this question of volunteerism I mean there's a general notion that you know, there's a more collaborative regulatory structure in some of the European nations, and that in the U.S., you know, we seem to have quite a bit of a whiplash in the last few years from kind of, you know, regulatory exuberance to deregulatory exuberance, and for a company making long-term decisions, neither of those postures are great. So, I mean, I feel like there's a very strong argument that I hear coming from a lot of industry which says, you know what, we got to set our own course. Right? You know, we're not happy with where Obama was. We're frankly not happy where Trump is. We're not going to be happy where the next president is because if we're in this kind of binary tribal backlash. And then a lot of people say, like, well, wait a minute, this is just happy talk, right? I mean, the, these partnerships are basically just codifying things that were going to happen anyways. They're just delaying tactics. You know, I know you hear all sides of this, but you know, how do you think about that? And how do you think about you know, Apache and API's role in, you know, do you feel like the partnership is, in fact, a replacement for 
a regulatory initiative? Do you think it is a clarifying you know, roadmap for how the government should act? I mean, where do, what do you see that relationship? Well, that's, act, that's actually a pretty good uh, summary of the various things you hear around this space. Thank you for that, Jason. Uh, I think the, the environmental partnership and this is, is also true One Future. I think what it's trying to do is, is use you know, the best and the brightest, the mem those people that come forward with the initiative and the know-how to share with each other the best ways to accomplish emission controls, other environmental performance metrics, and, and use that as a learning curve. One of, one of the things that, that argues in favor of the voluntary is that the diversity of energy production you know, geographically, whether it's, uh, you know, Alaska to the Gulf of Mexico in the United States, whether it's conventional or unconventional, you know, there's different geologies, there's different uh, ages of equipment, there's different pressures. There's, there's no one size that fits all. And, and then you look at the, the diversity of the, of the companies that are operating in the space, you know, it's you know, big multinationals and, and small family-owned companies. Uh, the diversity is, is, is too much to try and fit into a, a real standard rule set. You know, goals and objectives and let people figure out how to get there in a way that fits their particular situation best is something that, that we believe and, and, and we see evidence that supports that belief is the best way to achieve improvements, particularly on a cost-effective basis. You know, it's, it's, it's easy to write a rule that won't produce very much in the way of, of, of reductions, but we'll spend a lot of money. And how, I mean, how effective, yeah, yeah please. Yeah, I'd love, if, if, if you, we have a second. That's the whole point. Uh, so from the downstream perspective, I, w I, would, I would echo that. If you remember, tr traditionally sustainability was a Venn diagram financial, environmental, social. And, and that's worth thinking about. We've talked about it here. You have to have all three, otherwise your tripod's not gonna stand up. And sometimes there are tensions. Let me give you an example. If you think of Beijing a couple of years ago, where, where you saw people walk around with masks and you couldn't see down the end of the street because the air quality was so bad, the country had made a decision because of its financial and economic uh, social needs for its people that really eclipsed the environmental sphere. And, and it, it showed up as a problem. And you can see those tensions and how they get out of whack all the time. So from the downstream perspective, if you think about what we've been doing, energy is one of our top three costs. So you have feedstocks, you have the personnel, and you have your, your energy costs. There is an enormous incentive for us without regulation to manage those costs. And if you think about our tripod, to keep that tripod standing from a financial. There also hasn't been a refinery built in the United States since the 1970s. So you have this very, very long history of, uh, as John mentioned, different ages, different complexities, built for different feedstocks. The energy sector has changed over time, have made investments. Regulations have changed over time from the downstream sector. The, the fuel quality regulations, the sulfur standards and others, and the refineries have complied with that. So you have an inherent operational incentive to be efficient and we're still regulated, regardless of the change with the current administration. And we think smart regulation. We're not against regulation, but it needs to be smart regulation. And we, we still have EPA obligations. We still have OSHA. We still have FIMSA, all the alphabet suit. We'll decipher later. We still have EIA. So when you think of our operations from the downstream perspective, they're very regulated on site throughout the value chain, and then also also reported out very publicly. There's a lot of transparency in, in the downstream sector as well. So let me ask one more question on this, and then I want to ask Don a little bit about um, his project, which is that the, the idea of volunteerism is also based on the idea of peer pressure incentives, right? As much as you have the obvious internal incentives, if one of your competitors chooses not to make these investments, that's a competitive issue. The entire industry suffers if any single actor acts irresponsibly, because that then tends to become a motivator for some kind of you know, aggressive regulatory agenda. Does volunteerism raise all boats? In other words, you know, is, if, if you were able to make the case that within this voluntary process there was pressure put on, in any industry there's always leaders and laggards, that there was actually pressure put on laggards, that makes a stronger argument and kind of confronts, I think, one of the main arguments for regulation, which is you have to kind of ultimately level the playing field. 
is the partnership pulling people to do things they wouldn't have otherwise done, or is it rewarding the people who were leaders already? Uh, I, both. Think, I think the environmental partnership is, is, is challenging all members of the industry to, to step their game up. Mm -hmm. that's, that, that's the whole premise. Uh, right now, I think we've got like 43 members over a, a thir getting close to a third of the gas production in the United States mm -hmm. is represented. It, it will, uh, you know, those that, that don't step forward and improve and, and, and meet the expectations of the communities they, that they, they work in are, are going to uh, be questioned. You're, you're right. We, you know, we, we have a saying around the company, you know, we're, we're only, as an industry, we're only judged as the worst among us. Mm -hmm. and, and that, because those are the ones that will make the paper right. and get, get held up as, you know, the, the, the poster industry. child for the industry, which often isn't true, but we know that that's perception. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're trying to be as inclusive in the partnership as we can be for just that reason. So Don, I want you to talk a little bit. So you know, I think of what you've done is kind of the Walmart model, right? You're basically very much in the middle of that value chain. You're very big purchasers, which gives you market power, different than an individual homeowner. Um, what has been the result? I mean, obviously, you've, you've put out, this is reasonably new, you've put out these criteria. What's the relationship been like with the producers, many of whom are involved? I mean, what, what, what's your hope in terms of what you'll be able to say five years from now was the result of the exercise. Yeah, so great question. Um, before we, we got to these mm -hmm. performance indicators I was talking about, I should indicate that we spent an entire year through a rigorous engagement with all of the stakeholders. Um, and from the environmental, production, you know, anyone you can essentially think of was interested in this, to balance all of these things that we were just talking about. Um, and I'll add, I'll, I'll answer your question, but I want to add right to ahead. what you were talking about before earlier is, um, when we met, I sort of wore the ESG hat in our, in our company, and when I met with our engineers to balance how difficult sometimes it is and tax and to collect some of this information. I'll give you a very, and, and it's, uh, and I just want to bring it up because it's not appreciated or widely understood by the general public. So when I met with our engineers, I said, look, you know, we're doing a lot of methane emission space. Can we reduce our emissions from, you know, what can we talk, do about blowdowns? Blowdowns is when a gas utility or upstream company or transmission we take out an old pipeline, we're replacing it, or during a maintenance, we're evacuating the gas. And it seems like a simple question, right? But then, you know, when, when I met with a team of engineers, they said, we have to go, through, let's go through all of our procedures. You know, we have certain operating pressure these pipes are at. They're, let's say, just pretty high pressure. Before we evacuate the gas, we reduce the pressure. So we minimize the amount of gas that's flowing. So do I consider that reduction in pressure, reduction in emissions? I said yes. And then there were all of these very complicated engineering angles that go into what you do doing your procedures and you evacuate the gas. So just to capture the amount of gas that's evacuated from a blowdown seems like a very simple thing, but it takes months of work with engineers to actually be able to quantify this. Now to answer your question then, you say how do you move forward? The indicator that we're just talking about, so what do you do with them when you engage the uh, production companies? We have actually put this into our RFP, into our gas suppliers. So when we send out an RFP, being one of the biggest buyers of commodity in gas, we are essentially nudging um, these producers. We're saying we as an, uh, have helped establish a natural gas supply collaborative. We have come up with these performance indicators. Our expectation is that you start, you begin to consider reporting on these, and we hope that over time, these will become part of your standard practice and the, this information will be available on your website. So we're not saying you must report on this. It's got, it's got to be in your response, but I would say again, it's, it's a nudge and also a poke to say, hey. And, and I might be violating antitrust, but are you purchasing more expensive gas if you believe that the criteria better match your aspirations? I don't think so because I think, and, and what John was talking about, all the producers are, are sort of, you know, want to be that responsible mm -hmm. actor as well because they're getting the same pressures from investors on their perspective as well. Like so, you said, you don't want to be the one that doesn't do the right thing. So a, a happy warning. I'm going to open this up uh, after one more question to you all. And if you don't ask questions after 19 seconds of awkward silence, I do have more questions I can, can ask. And I want to kind of end at least this part of the conversation focusing on, um, Maria, what you were saying, the G. 
So clearly, having shareholders who are owners of your companies, having a democratic voice in guiding the thing that they own is a pretty intuitive idea, and it's been fundamental to kind of corporate governance from the very beginning. It has also taken on a much different tenor in the last couple of years, and I, you know, I think climate has been the dominant leverage point there because a lot of people believe that we're not, as a nation, moving quickly enough and see this as a critical opportunity to accelerate that process. Um, how is that helping? And where does that create challenge? I'm thinking just shareholder resolutions in general and also a little bit of the conversation about transparency, great, unless you have 73 people helping you be transparent at once, at which point the cacophony of transparency can become kind of uncomfortable. But just say a little more about how you see the existing governance structures. Are they up to the task? And then I would hope, Tom, maybe you can reflect on that a little bit too. I think we have a terrific board, and we have a couple of committees that <coughs> focus specifically on the E, the S and the G, mm -hmm. and, and climate would fall under the E, and they think about the strategy and the long-term operational opportunities, what's going on in the in interim, what's medium-term, what's long-term. An important, I think, and a really critical component of the climate conversation is research and technology. When, when one looks at I would challenge any forecast you look at, at as global energy demand, global energy supply for 2040, 2050. And, and it's tough, right? Because even the super forecasters, five, seven years out, forecasts can be challenging. But they're out there. And they have fossil fuels, the significant portion of both energy use and energy demand. Um, I say that because re the research and the technologies don't fully exist today yet there's the aspiration. We have a research and uh, development department that does both fundamental, analytical, applied research and development for our operations, but then also really long term. And so we think things like organic photovoltaic, uh, battery storage, solid oxide fuel cells are really important technologies and they're on that horizon and part of the how that links to the G is the board and the executive team supports that within Phillips 66. So that, that's an important component we hadn't yet touched on that has to be part of this mix as we look very long term for national and global energy supply and demand. Well, I would say a couple of things about it. So, um, so at, at, at SASB, we, uh, well, let me say, first of all, boards differ across, you know, there are, uh, I don't know, 8,000 public companies in the United States now, 9,000, it's come down a bit. Um, you know, you have a huge range of boards, uh, sophistication and involvement in these issues. Uh, we have seen uh, really substantially more board involvement and uh, what you see from the legal community, which I come out of, is that um, lawyers in this, in this area are really pushing boards to recognize the importance of ESG. I, if you want to see an example of that, there was a, um, a, uh, a memo that was done by the uh, law firm of Wachtell Lipton just a couple of weeks ago, one of their standard uh, <coughs> client memos, and it's one of the top board advising firms in the United States. And <coughs> they said this is absolutely essential that boards get involved with, uh, with sustainability issues. They, they have to, and they, rate, they gave a whole list of things that boards should be doing. <coughs> the other thing is management of companies. Um, we, you know, traditionally the sustainability person was sort of in a silo <coughs> without really any sort of direct involvement with the financial part of the company, with the CEO, or the, uh, or, or, and, and that's changing. Um, I was at a meeting just on Monday with a company that's interested in doing better disclosures and doing, you know, using the SASB framework. And, you know, it was the sustainability person, and it was the CEO of the company, and the CFO, and the chief accounting officer. Those are the kind of people you want involved. Sustainability issues, are, these are financially related issues. Sometimes it's called non-financial issue. Well, it may not be financial statement issues. In other words, they don't show up in the, in the assets and liabilities and the cash flow statement or the balance sheet of the company, but these are financially related. That's at least how we approach it because we look at things that are financial and material. So you have to have board involvement. You have to have the right people in the management. You can't put sustainability, and a lot of companies do these sustainability reports. Most big companies are doing them now. <clears throat> it's it's so quite striking how frequently it's been the case in the past 
that the, 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 the uh, rest of the company doesn't even know what's in the sustainability report. It's sort of done off there. You know, they use words like this is material to the company and all this stuff, and the lawyers haven't even looked at this. You know, I think that is changing. And, and uh, SASB, by the way, just want to wrap it up. Um, we have always pushed for better disclosures using the, our standards, which are going to be finalized. They've been in, underway for many years. They're going to be finalized this September or October. <coughs> We've pushed for this stuff being included in SEC filings. We have basically said to the world uh, that, you know, if you have appropriate internal control and in, in appropriate governance processes in place, <clears throat> that it would be okay if you don't put it in an SEC filing. There's so many ways uh, companies communicate to investors now with, you know, letters, with web, web uh, postings, with uh, sustainability reports. You know, it may not be as essential that it be in an SEC filing as it was 10 or 20 years ago, you, but you have to have the governance processes in place, and that is, I think, what we're seeing more and more of. And Alani, as you look across a lot of different industry sectors, I mean, is there any aspect of the, the kind of the framework, not just the particular board, but the framework for social governance that you think is um, changing, could be improved? Yeah, I mean, it's always, it's a very dynamic process, which is which interesting, and I realize this is an oil and gas panel, but, you know, as Tom was just discussing, this, you know, ESG kind of funnels across different industry verticals. Um, in terms of the board process and the social governance process, I think what's interesting in the oil and gas realm is, you know, we, from a consultant's perspective, which is what I kind of am keeping this, you know, for this particular discussion is, you know, we get to see how, you know, companies like Philips 66, like Apache, have to essentially, you know, report out to external rating agencies like you were talking about, Maria, and that's difficult, and you just get a number put at the end. And one of the biggest challenges of that is because of the social governance and board and the G. That is a really difficult thing to manage. It's a very, the G has been around for a long time in sustainability and best practices and risk mitigation. It's very, it's one of the easier ones to quantify versus the S and the E. But that tends to be something that's always shifting within the oil and gas realm because, you know, to the point of the panelists, it's, you know, governance is very difficult because, you know, peop, uh, companies get dinged for if somebody is not as independent as they think, if there's not enough women on the board. You know, there's all these different issues that kind of come into play for governance. And so this is always shifting. And to the matters at hand of how you get, you know, the, mo the best company, the most superior business model, it really ties back to the G, to the point of Maria, it, you know, GES. G is huge in oil and gas, and it's going to continue to kind of evolve over the next few months, next year. But today, where we are, this conversation is bigger and more prevalent than it's been two weeks ago, a, m a month ago, you know, five years ago. So it's constantly changing. So I'm going to belay my next few questions, uh, hoping that you might uh want to engage a little bit and then we'll have some closing thoughts and we have some fleet-footed mic runners if you just uh, raise your hand let us know who you are and ask away thanks very much um, my name is Amanda Rishbeth I'm from Australia I've come from a long way um, but uh, my background is in health uh, for many years and currently I'm a visiting scientist at the Harvard School, Chan School, uh, and we're working on a large project with the business school and the Chan School. And it's really around ESG, but it's this idea of the culture of health within ESG. So you might say, well, in the S, we'd cover that off in health and safety. But our premise and our work is really around saying, actually, it's a bigger play. It's a play across environment and social that can really have a really high societal impact, which companies can get credit for. Mm -hmm. So we think that companies aren't getting enough credit that they can disclose and add to this mix. And perhaps that's something that can be thought of, and particularly in the SASB standards within human and social capital categories across the, the uh, mater um, materiality map, et cetera, that culture of health lens is really sort of a cross piece that can really help companies disclose what great work they're doing and get that benefit to society and benefit for the investors, link it to the SDG, SDG goals, et cetera. So I, that's a comment first. So my question is, in all the work that you're doing across that, are you seeing health coming in in a different lens uh, rather than just sort of more siloed into sort of health and safety? I'll, I'll take an initial crack at it. Um, because I feel like there's a great case study, the city of New York um, was looking at the SO2 concentrations from heating oil, because New York City has a lot of heating oil. So the Bloomberg administration, actually they did not work with National Grid, at that time they worked with EDF. How do we improve the air quality in the city of New York? And 
the city of New York is very different and unique than other cities. Most cities, the emissions come from transportation, and then secondary is buildings. New York City is the opposite. Most of your emissions come from buildings, and there's a lot of buildings if you've been to New York. Um, so the city came up with this clean heat initiative, and the clean heat initiative is essentially phasing out number six and number four heating oil. And as a result today, New York City actually has the cleanest air it's had in, I think, over 50 years. And it was driven by that health consideration. So I think that was a really good example that we were not really involved, but there was another stakeholder, right, the mayor of the city of New York and working with EDF, coming at it at, from the angle of air quality and improving health. And, and so it could be reported for rather being reported just as an environmental benefit, mm -hmm. which is, is clear and obvious, it could also be reported as a health benefit. Mm -hmm. So there's that sort of broader... Um, and you're right. We don't sort of report on it, though. You're right. But the city does. So yeah, the mayor's yeah. office will say, look, here's where the air quality, and they have actually satellite images saying what, you know, the SO2 concentration. But that's a very good but point. Yeah, correct. We're not reporting on it, even though we were, in a way, a partner. But that's, that's a very good point. Mm -hmm. We have a question in the back corner. Thank you. My name is Bill Holland. I'm a reporter for S&P Global Market Intelligence. This message is for you, Alana, and maybe you, Tom, before John jumps in. Um, I look at his member list, and I've spent years writing about these companies resisting shareholder proposals to disclose financial risk, uh, stranded assets for climate change. How can this industry correct the impression that organizations like John are just a fig leaf uh, that management, until Larry Fink and Vanguard and State Street changed their mind this year, these r resolutions all went down in flames every year. Mm -hmm. uh, and now all of a sudden they're not. And how, how, how does the industry preempt the impression that John's organization is just a fig leaf? They don't really care about this stuff. Yeah. That's a phenomenal question. And I think that's why, I think truly that's one of the biggest reasons why we wanted to have this panel is because the oil and gas industry really takes a marketing hit for any kind of sustainability, environmental best practices conversation. Just by the nature of operations, it's you know intensive and it has impacts the environment to you know, we just had a health question about emissions. And so I think that's why this opportunity is something that oil and gas has really grabbed onto and they've really started to not only embrace the you know movement of ESG Mm -hmm. the management came out very strongly against continually year after year. The perception is, is that they don't, they don't care about this stuff. How do they change that? Because I think the perception, first of all, is not correct. I John a chance to defend the industry. Yeah. Know. Well, I think we're on the same page, so it'll be a, it'll be a good answer. Um, but. Essentially, the perception is, is not that they don't care. And shareholder, so let's start with the shareholder resolution part of that question, because it's a really fundamental aspect of where this is coming from. Shareholder resolutions are on the rise, particularly two degree you know, scenarios, and getting companies to want to report. And that's actually the biggest growth in the ESG shareholder resolution space, is two degrees. And just in 2017, we saw for the first time that um, ExxonMobil, Occidental, and then a utility had, you know, had majority votes to report on those issues. We saw this year that Kinder Morgan, Anadarko, and Range all have either a two degree Celsius shareholder proposal or a methane reporting initiative that they have to essentially abide by. And what's interesting is, you know, as a consultant, we engage with these companies. The part you're leaving out in this story is that management resisted those motions. So, so John, why don't you talk a little bit? I mean, the, the question is, yes. you know. The marketplace is now making demands. Yes. They're being reflected in resolutions. Management is responding. And the question is, are you leading, are you following, or do you not, does it not matter? Well, one of the things you alluded to earlier was the, the necessity for long-range planning. You know, you, you have to decide where you're going as a company, you know, and invest the money to get there, and you have to stick with that. You can't be changing course every other year as concerns uh, and demands may invite you to do. So some, some of those proposals are, are just you know, not in sync with that long range plan. You know, they, they may be uninformed, they may just have a, a, a different uh, uh, vision about where the company needs to go, but it, at the end of the day it's not in sync with the, the plans laid by the company and, and their, their execution. 
uh, you know, they're, they're, they're the proposals that are more uh, aspirational in, in a bigger picture, and then there's those that, that are very detailed. And, you know, the more detailed they are, the more likely they're, they are to, to, to be discounted. In fact, I think there was even a, a court ruling this last week that, that said, you know, as a shareholder, you don't get to drive the bus. You know, you can, you can make recommendations, but there, there's a point where sp you can get specific off proposals <laughs> get to, to the point of meddling, is I think the term that the court used. So, uh, you know, I think, I think companies, obviously they hear what their shareholders are, are saying and they're sensitive to that, but they don't always want to adopt those resolutions because they may differ from the long-range plan of the company. And, and from a, you know, an environmental perspective, sometimes they're uninformed because there are people out there that will tell you, oh, these certain things actually save the company money. Well, the reality may be that they do not, that they're very costly or that acting in that manner is a very inefficient use of, of pollution control dollars. Right. I think so, one just kind of, uh, you know, BPC reflection is there's an inflection point in the climate discussion as it relates to the oil and gas industry. And I think there's a lot of energy to try to debate motives retroactively. Um, I think there's a lot of promise in seizing the opportunity around this inflection point. And so I think, you know, at least from our standpoint, if you want to assert that companies were responding to what they perceive to be their dominant shareholder interest in not following these processes, they were opposing them. I think you're right. It now seems like the majority, now that the big industrial institutional investors are coming on board with the nuns, you have majority rule. And my guess is that now we are seeing the conversation shift to the question of how do those resolutions come forward? What's the best way to make sure that they actually have the leverage directionally? Um, but I would ask if anybody thinks that this genie is going back in this bottle, yeah. raise your hands. I mean, my expectation is we're going to be, the reason we can have this conversation is I think what you've seen with Exxon and others is going to become more the norm than the exception. And now the question is how do we make sure as a society that's an efficient process that actually drives us towards a social goal. And just to finish up with that too, it's a part of this is, you know, we've worked with clients who have actively in the oil and gas space who have actively said, listen, we hear you, we hear what you're asking for, you know, we're happy to engage with you. And then the resolution is withdrawn. So it doesn't have to necessarily be passed to have a, you know, you know, transparent disclosure initiated, you can withdraw resolutions as well. And that's a huge, you know, a change factor as well to John's point in that it's not necessarily the right thing to do. Not all shareholder resolutions are good resolutions. Some of them can be ridiculous at some point and some of them are powerful. We have another question right here in the second row. If I could, Jason, one, one last thing on that. Uh, I think the dialogue is what's important. I mean, it, it, so in, in the past in particular, there would be no dialogue between the company and people with these concerns except through shareholder resolution. And one thing that Apache has, has learned over time is it, it's in our best interest to engage with some of these folks on a routine basis. And in fact, our CEO has uh, a, a day every, every September where we meet with some of the ESG activist investors and, and talk about what do they want. And it's a two-way conversation. And just like uh, in, in every one of those dialogues I've been a part of, both sides come away with a different appreciation of what's possible and what's cost effective and what can be done. So I think to, to Lana's point, if the dialogue is taking place, the shareholder resolutions may not be as necessary as they were in the past. Sorry. Hi, uh, Aaron Annable. I cover uh, energy at the Canadian Embassy here in DC. Um, I wanted to pick up on a comment that you made earlier, Maria, about you know having a rational conversation. And I think you know that's all well and it's good. Very Canadian here. of you. <laughs> <laughs> it's all well and good here in this room, but I, I don't know. My sense is that you know the middle ground on these issues has become a challenge. You know, both in terms of of, of being able to get to yes on actually building an energy infrastructure project. And also in terms of the, the fossil divestment campaigns that are sort of targeting all the banks. Um, and, you know, I work for a government that's actually in the process of, of purchasing a pipeline mm -hmm. um, after we conducted the most comprehensive project assessment in our country's history. Uh, we believe it's in the national interest. 
it's going to be carrying a product that's produced under a framework with a $30 a ton price on carbon and a hard emissions cap. Uh, and yet we're still, you know, you know, it's a very challenging issue for us. So I guess what I'm asking is, do you, are there ESG, you know, specific ESG actions that your companies have taken that have helped you sort of gain some of this middle ground? That's a great question. This sort of t dovetails, and it, it came to my mind with the last question. Outreach and engagement, I think, is really important. Um, I will talk to just about anyone who's going to be rational. Now, I don't want to be screamed at. I don't want, so that, that's not going to go very far. The haters are going to want to hate. And the people who really, really love us, almost regardless, um, th they may or may not want to talk with us. But, but there's that continuum in the middle. And we make a point of systematically and strategically going out to a wide swath and going out of our way. I mean, there, there are employees who, on vacation, who happen to be in a fairly remote spot, set up ESG engagement conversations with people because we have the opportunity to meet with them on an international basis or whatever it happens to be. Um, but being willing to put the resources into it, having the organization, having the, the knowledge of the organization of what are our key points that we want to deliver and what are we willing to hear that may be a tricky or a sticky conversation. And, and if we aren't able to answer it on the spot, be, bring it back and commit to follow up. We have found that that's been really effective. It, it won't necessarily keep people from handcuffing themselves to a dangerous piece of equipment that I think most of the people in this room wouldn't want to do, but, but it does help then the people in the middle um, and you have your supporters to, to come together and understand what's going on. I think that also then also helps mitigate when proposals do come up or when a question does come up that they know that there's an avenue to get an answer that's not greenwashing from the company because the relationships have been developed. So that happy to talk more about it, but I mean, we've had a very systematic um, over time. It's not a quick hit. You may have to respond because of an incident or an emergency, but it has to be sustained, I think, over time. And that may be the bridge on that tension of the short and long term, Jason, that you were asking about earlier. Time for a couple other questions. Right here. Hi. Um, I am with the Department of Energy for the, just for the summer. I'm an intern. So I have a question. It's a little bit general, also a little bit specific. Um, so Bloomberg, with their recent energy outlook for until 2050, I think it was, they said even with these exponential growth rates of renewable energy, with the price, prices just dropping like crazy, um, even with that outlook, we still won't hit our, we'll still be above the two degree warming, which means catastrophic floods. Um, disease vectors increasing in all parts of the world in all seasons. So, you know, I could go on, but ESG is about this long-term view, right? So I think it's interesting that even with growth in renewable energy, um, there's still enough demand for, for example, like natural gas peaker plants um, that just that little element of that having to meet when the sun isn't shining and the wind isn't blowing, that is enough to keep us above two degrees and ultimately be a huge hit in profits, right, and value to companies if you have to win these, when the effects of climate change become even huger than they are today. So I think I'm wondering about how that is taken into account. If you're going long term, how long term are you going and are you taking into account the climate change that is going to happen from this two degree warming? And more specifically, um, are there any ideas about how to meet those demand management needs through like energy efficiency? Um, smart home controls, things like that. Battery storage, yeah. So, you know, I mean, I guess the I think it's a really important question, and this is the collective action challenge. You know, how are you trying to internalize the potential costs of catastrophic climate change? And is that something that, you know, your accountants are thinking about? So I feel like I could talk about an hour and this it was a great question and, and the, just having a hard time to respond in, in, a, in 60 seconds but I'll just tell you just a couple of weeks ago we released our 8050 8050 roadmap in, in Boston um, and we did a lot of internal modeling analysis and the message was to all of our stakeholders there is a big gap between the ambition and where you are today which goes to your question so we said if you really wanted to so we have 8050 
um, 80% reduction by 2050. And then we said, we have done our analysis midpoint, 40, 30. And he said, this is where your current policies are in Massachusetts, you know, where we operate in Massachusetts, New York, and Rhode Island. This is your current policies won't even get you close to that 40, 30. And in order for that to happen, the following things need to happen. Much, you know, ramp up in energy efficiency that you talked about. We essentially said, you know, the light duty vehicles, there has to be a very significant uptick in, in the electrification of the transportation sector, really pushing out, starting to phase out, you know, heating oil um, in those regions. Um, so I think that's the education piece and the engagement I think everybody's been talking about. And, and we have done the modeling. You know, I've, I've, I've spent so much time with physicists um, who've done some really great modeling, and, and they've been saying um, one of the reasons we as a company are you know, promoting alternative renewables other than just solar and wind, which we are, things like renewable natural gas. We're looking into things like power to gas, hydrogen blending, all of those things. Because when I talk to those people, they say, if you look at all the, the most optimistic scenarios for renewables, and you look at the energy, the global energy picture for demand, you're not really getting close to that. So again, it goes back to that engagement. But through that effort that I just talked about that we just released in, in Boston, um, was directly engaging our regulators and policymakers and all of them stakeholders saying, hey, you want to get to here? This is your goal. And this is where your current targets are getting you to. And there's a big gap. Time for a final question up front, and then we'll have some just closing thoughts. My name is Alan Kotsky, a reporter for Bloomberg. I want to follow up on something Jason Gourmet pointed out, the, the, the possibility that uh, sometimes regulations are needed to level the playing field. I'm curious, I guess this would especially be for, for John and Maria, do you, do you, does your company actually have to worry about competitors who don't adopt best practices? Does it necessarily give them an economic advantage that's notable enough to actually worry about it? or or is the problem with other companies not that they get a big competitive advantage, but only that they give the, the industry a black eye? That's a great question. You want me to go? Go ahead. I'll try to answer. That's a, that's, a, that's a tough question. I'll try to answer it. So, so part of the regulatory process, I think, that works and helps levelize perhaps some of the concerns you raised are how r rules are either implemented or amended. So there's all public comment, and as we know, extensive public comments going. So you're going to get that variation of what the impact is on people's different points of view or companies' different points of view when they comment on the regulations. And then the agency is going to have to weigh all of that, and OMB is going to have to review all of that, and the final regulation comes out. Um, it, so it, it's regulations that are picking winners and losers are not particularly smart regulations, our perspective. But in the end, I think you get something that is generally applicable. Um, we have to mind our swim lane. We, we have to mind our shop. We have to mind what our company is doing. And if another company is non-compliant or wants to cheat or um, you're doing some wrong or not following their regulations, we, we really have to leave that to their oversight regulators, enforcement, and, and, and um, can't really, I mean, we just have to, we have to be good at what we do. And then I think the trade associations can be a wonderful avenue for best practices sharing. And, and there is, in, in the, the pipeline segment as an example, has really taken from the aviation industry. No one wants a plane to fall out of the sky. That is the worst outcome there. And, and so our pipeline industry with the trade associations has gone to really rigorous, transparent incident sharing to avoid and to try to drive out that last 0.001% of where incidents on pipelines happen. So, so you have several functions, I think, that can help you uh, get a good regulation, operate really well, share best practices to ideally raise the level of the ocean. Because this is a really important sector that, as the woman from the DOE pointed out, will remain for a very long time. That's a great question, one we, we kind of struggle with internally. Uh, the good news is, generally, the, the people that we consider to be peer competitors are also the ones that are joining these volunteer organizations and, and kind of doing, doing the, the right thing on their own. Uh, one of the things we really believe is that it, it's through that collaborative volunteer effort where you def, 
you help define what's possible, what's economically achievable, and, and what is productive. If you have the chance to go through that, that process, and then, if need be, adopt that as a rule to bring in those that don't participate, I think everybody wins that way. Where, where we, you know, the converse of that is if bad rulemaking occurs early on, before you have a chance to, to define the, the feasible and productive, then everybody suffers and often those people that were recalcitrant in the voluntary process don't pay attention to the rules either. So, so I, I, I do see that the voluntary process is the way to find the best answer. And then if, if need be down the road, that has to be turned into a regulatory requirement. You know, mm -hmm. I, I guess I'll let the regulators decide that. That's that is as close good, as an executive in an oil company has ever said to welcoming a regulatory approach. I want to thank you for, I want to thank you for that. Well, I, I, I will tell you, I have, I have seen, I have seen um, in different industries the regulatory approach used to weed out yeah. the, those that do, do not come up to the common bar. Yep. And, and no, it has, that ener energy just hasn't evolved to that point yep. quite yet, I think. All right, look, I want to thank our panelists very much for uh, sharing their thoughts. Uh, you all for joining us. As I said, this is um, the beginning of a series of discussions. And now that we've captured, like um, Mark Zuckerberg, all your uh, information, we will be coming back to you with uh, further thoughts. So thank you very much.